Okay, so in this video, I want to talk about the temple and the impact that uh, Freemasonry may have had or may have not had on the temple. Uh, I will say, please watch the video I just released in conjunction with this, in a sense, on uh, the ancient ties to uh, temple ritual. If you watch that, you almost don't need to watch this video specifically, in my opinion, but let's go into it. So what is Freemasonry? Well, it's one of the oldest and largest fraternal organizations uh, in the world, uh, four million members today. Its origins are from the medieval stone uh, guilds. Uh, first reference you can find is in 975 AD in York, England. Um, it really they started to collapse in the late 1600s though with the tough economy um, and they so they decided to open it up to non stonemasons in a sense um, and attract other members it really got its start though in 1717 when the first Grand Lodge was formed in London and some craziness really started to develop in 1737 is a lot of uh, stories were, were told uh, there's a lecture in France uh, Chevalier Ramsey talked about um, a elaborate story of the Crusaders and the Knights Templar uh, helping to preserve uh, the craft with secrets that recovered from the Holy Land um, and so there's just a lot of interesting things it was a very controversial group it still is because of the secrecy uh, in fact Joseph Smith said that uh, the secret of uh, masonry is to keep a secret uh, there but that was part of their practice and to show fidelity to, to the covenants essentially um, also there was concern that it replaced religion uh, without salvation there it required belief in God but there was no focus on Christ and no focus on any kind of salvation uh, in, in there um, it's a uh, focus on ritual drama uh, teaching uh, through active participation um, focus on a man named Hiram Abeth Hiram, that's the legendary name uh, but it is an actual person in 1st Kings 7 Hiram of Tyre uh, the widow's son um, of the tribe of and the Naftali, he is essentially murdered, um, and you participate in this in, in masonry uh, for not sharing the secrets, uh, the secret passwords, uh, in a sense, um, th that was there. And he was in First Kings seven instructed to uh, help build the temple. In fact, uh, even the um, uh, uh, the basin with the twelve oxen, uh, he was given instruction to do that um, there. But um, the active participation is to reinforce moral and social values, especially fidelity um, there, and uh, they believe he was the master architect of the temple. So why did Joseph want to join? Well, Joseph and the Saints uh, in Nauvoo, uh, this is when this happened. Um, if you think about it, they've been driven out of several states now, and uh, any kind of uh, brotherly kindness through a fraternal organization, and that was their focus is, is brotherhood, um, was would be would have been very attractive, uh, especially with with non-members uh, possible, and help protect them in a sense. Also, the thought of, of going back to Solomon's Temple, um, that was the very solid understanding everyone had of, of this at that time, uh, and so there would have been a desire, I think, to learn uh, there line upon line, which had happened uh, throughout the Restoration. So the Nauvoo Lodge was built uh, at the end of 1841. Joseph Smith uh, went through it in mid-March, March 15th of 1842. He received uh, the initiation and went through uh, the three uh, degrees, uh, main degrees of, of masonry to become the master mason. And then he introduced the endowment about two months later on May 4th in the red brick store. So a huge problems started to develop because it, uh, there were just the number of masons in Nauvoo, 1,200. There were 2,000 in the United States, 1,200 in Nauvoo. So it created a lot of strains uh, there and concerns of, of power. Um, in fact, Joseph actually uh, is believed were, were killed uh, uh, in the martyrdom by uh, fellow Masons. Uh, in fact, his his uh, cry, "Oh Lord, my God," was was viewed by many as the the Masonic call for distress, which did no good to if those were his Masonic brothers, uh, in a sense. So comparing to the temple, the the Masonry and the temple are so dramatically different. Uh, if you think about again, uh, uh, belief in Christ, salvation. Um, no women are allowed. Um, it's just for men that can become masons. There are some auxiliaries that allow women now, uh, but uh, no no women um, initiates. Uh, no, there's no baptism, no ordinances in that sense. There's salvation, no washings, anointings that we do in the temple, uh, sealings uh, to children or to spouses, no proxy work, no priesthood. Um, so uh, there's just tremendous uh, differences uh, foundationally. The place where there's some similarities that come about are in the endowment in the ritualistic uh, format of the, the way that uh, the endowment's done and then some, some symbols. 
also that I'll go through. So a few great quotes here. Not a uh, non-member, even anti Fanny Stenhouse it is it is always been commonly reported and to a great extent believed that the mysteries of the endowment house were only a sort of initiation of the rites of masonry. But I need hardly say that this statement, when examined by the light of facts, is altogether ungrounded and absurd. The Catholic scholar Massimo Intravagine writes, Anti-Mormons often read too much into similarities between the endowment and Masonic ritual. Smith had used the Masonic language of the rituals for the purpose of confirming his followers familiar with Freemasonry into a doctrine which had no similarities with anything they had heard in the Masonic lodges. Now, in the endowment, the, the Masonic imagery or ritual teachings, there are four possibilities for believers in my, in my mind. This is my own slide, just the way I put it together. But uh, Masonry, Freemasonry ties directly back to Solomon's temple, 100%. Or number two, Masonry ties back to early Christianity, which was influenced by ancient temples. Number three, Masonic rituals are not ancient, but Joseph and everyone of his era thought they were, and God was able to use this as a catalyst for the full revelation on the temple endowment. Remember, God speaks in the language of his children and their circumstances. Or four, some combination of the above. And that's my guess, is number two and three uh, would be my guess of the, the combination uh, here. And I'll show that as we go through, um, hopefully. Okay. Um, there was actually in 2008 a Desert News uh, interview with a new master or new uh, grandmaster um, of the Utah uh, uh, Grand Lodge of Mason that was it's a member of the church. Um, and he said uh, here in the interview, Freemasonry is not a religious practice, but confusion about what it stems in part from the fact that the fraternity is believed by many historians to have originated in the ancient world because its symbols and rituals bear some similarity to sacred ceremonies that existed among the Egyptians, Coptic Christians, Israelites, and even the Catholic and Protestant liturgies, all thought to have some common biblical source. I'm going to come back to that. Many believe it originated with some stonemasons who worked on Solomon's temple in Jerusalem, thought, though not no definitive evidence, that that legend is known to exist. Others speculate that its tenets were had by Enoch and possibly by Adam. Scholars have documented evidence that institutional masonry dated back only to the Middle Ages, when great European cathedrals were being built by guilds of stonemasons who practiced the craft. Okay, the original or uh, the official uh, church website on the topic of masonry says the emphasis on the similarities between the teaching styles and outward forms of masonry and the temple endowment obscure significant differences in their substance. Masonic uh, ceremonies promote self-improvement, brotherhood, charity, and fidelity to truth for the purpose of making better men who in turn make a better society. During temple ordinances, men and women covenant with God to obey his laws for the purpose of gaining exaltation through the atonement of Jesus Christ. Masonic rituals deliver stage-by-stage -stage instruction using dramatization and symbolic gestures and clothing with content based on Masonic legends. The endowment employs similar teaching devices, but it draws primarily upon the revelations and inspired translations given to Joseph Smith for its content. If you look here, in the, I love what was said in the Encyclopedia of Mormonism by Kenneth Godfrey. Um, he said, resemblances between the two rituals are limited to a small portion of actions and words. And I would add some symbols, which I'm going to go through. Indeed, some find that the LDS endowment has more similarities with the pyramid texts and the Coptic documents than with Freemasonry. Even where the two rituals share symbolism, the fabric of meanings is different. In addition to creation and life themes, one similarity is that both call for the participation the participants to make covenants. Yet the endowment alone ties covenants to eternal blessings into Jesus Christ. The Masonic ceremony does not emphasize priesthood or the need to be commissioned by God to represent him. The active participation of God in the world and in men's lives is a distinct, distinctly LDS temple motif. While Masons believe in an undefined, impersonal God, everything in the LDS endowment emanates from or is directed to God, who is a personage and man's eternal father. The endowment looks to the eternities and to eternal lives, but Freemasonry is earthbound, pervaded by human legend, and hope for something better. And he goes on to say, Freemasonry is a fraternal society and a ritual. All promises, oaths, and agreements are made between members. In the Temple Endowment, on the other hand, all covenants are between the individual and God. In Freemasonry, testing, grading, penalizing, or sentencing accords with the rules of the fraternity or membership votes. In the Endowment, God alone is the judge. Within Freemasonry, rank and promotions are of great importance, while in the LDS Temple Rites, there are no distinctions. All participants stand equally before God. The clash between good and evil including Satan's role, is essential to and vividly depicted in the endowment. 
but is largely absent from Masonic rites. Temple ceremonies emphasize salvation for the dead through vicarious ordinance works, such as baptism for the dead. Nothing in Masonic ritual allows for proxies acting on behalf of the dead. Women participate in all aspects of LDS temple rites. Through, though Freemasonry has women auxiliaries, Masonic ritual excludes them. The endowment's in inclusion of females underscores perhaps the most fundamental difference between the two rites. LDS temple rites unite husbands and wives and their children in eternal families. Latter-day Saint ceilings would be completely out of place in the context of Masonic ceremonies. Thus, Latter-day Saints see their temple ordinances as fundamentally different from Masonic and other rituals and think of similarities as remnants from an ancient original. Absolutely love that. Okay, and then if you want to pause the screen, you can read this. This is Matt Brown. This book is the book I would highly recommend if you want a, a big read on this. Uh, Matt Brown, Exploring the Connections Between Mormons and Masons. Um, and here he does a great summary of temp what temple activities are centered on what Masonic activities are centered on. Dramatic difference, and it's kind of parallels to a lot of the stuff we just read there in the Encyclopedia of Mormonism. If you go, um, Joseph's command to build the Nauvoo Temple, the Revelation, in, in 1841, January, talks about washing, uh, uh, a house will built to my name, Moses, the tabernacle, to build a house in the land of promise, that those ordinances might be revealed, which have been hid from before the world was, your anointings, your washings, your baptisms for the dead, memorials for your sacrifices, and listen to this, for your oracles. Now, in 1833, that meant divine statements and commandments. So think of divine statements and commandments in your most holy places, wherein you receive conversations and your statues and judgments. And down, house be built, um, kept hid from before the foundation of the world. And I will show unto my servant Joseph all things pertaining to this house and the priesthood thereof. Fascinating um, there. And so... Um, you know, this is this is well. You know, a year plus before Joseph went through uh, and, be, and became a Mason. Uh, there, the Lord was preparing uh, his his uh, mind and what was going to happen uh, there. So, um, uh, if you will look again at uh, in this book from Matt Brown, he talks about the connection between um, uh, early Christianity. So. If you look your Orthodox Christianity is the place to start looking when it comes to the question of Masonic origins. The Encyclopedia Britannica goes so far as to state that up until the Grand Lodge era, 1717, Freemasonry was wholly Christian in nature. Robert Cooper, the curator of the Grand Lodge of Scotland Museum and Library, puts it plainly, Freemasonry adopted much Christian symbolism and iconography. Freemasonry doubtless used other sources and invented some, but the majority were adopted from Christianity. How far did the borrowing of the Masons extend? According to John Hamill, none of the symbolism employed in Freemasonry is peculiar to Freemasonry. It has all been borrowed. With this perspective in mind, it seems prudent to look at Orthodox Christianity as a source for the setting and practice of the Freemasons. Now, it's fascinating. He does this. He look at this. He, he compares the Masonic lodges um, to the early Christian churches, and he, and he goes through this in the book in detail and shows these uh, specific things, the lodges, the altar, the chair settings for leaders, the mosaic floor, the candlesticks, the shiny icon for God seen in the east, and how these tie to early Christian churches. Then he goes even deeper. This is fascinating. He goes into the early uh, Christian rites and their ties to these in, in masonry. And these are the sub uh, chap subsections of this long chapter. He goes through temple. Guard, three degrees, drama, manner of presentation, prayer, darkness and light, oaths and obligations, mysteries, circumbobulation, almsgiving, investiture, regalia, death and immortality, and catechism. He says, an important clue about the origins of masonry rituals can be found in the writings of one Masonic historian from the late 19th century. He notes that in the year 1870, he traveled to Rome and witnessed the initiation of a Benedictine monk at St. Paul's Basilica. And then he actually gives in the book the actual... Uh, uh, description of this initiation. And then he says, those who are familiar with the initiation rites of Freemasonry cannot fail to recognize the parallels between this Orthodox Christian ritual and that used for the induction of speculative Masons. Indeed, the further back in time one looks, the closer the connection between Masons and the Christian faith becomes. Then it gets really crazy, uh, fascinating. He uh, includes in his book, Another Masonic author who took an interest in this line of thought in modern times was a reverend by the name of Neville Cryer. I think I know where we came from, he said. The real basis of Freemasonry is Christian understanding, and the purpose of the rites is to place a man on figurative pil pilgrimage to God's heavenly temple. Reverend Cryer's studies led him to the conclusion that some of the legendary material of the craft came from a world history composed by a, Rus a Roman Catholic monk. In addition, he concludes that Masonic signs originated with the set of gestures utilized by a few of the Orthodox monastic orders. He felt that the cat 
catechetical instruction of masonry was rooted in the method of monastic worship, like the uh, the, the chatter uh, and uh, chanter and deacon statement and response routine performed in the in the choir. Allegory coupled with symbolism, according to Cryer, can be traced to the monk known as the Venerable Bede, uh, 673 to 735 uh, AD, who wrote about the Israelite temple. His work even became part of the monastic curriculum. Finally, Cryer thought that the Jesuit monks employed symbols that the Freemasonry had adopted. So my next question is, where did these monks get it from way back then? So fascinating thoughts. Okay, so let's look at actually various comments from early church leaders on masonry. Will Willard Richards, the masonry had its origin in the priesthood. A hint to the wise is sufficient. Heber C. Kimball, there is a similarity of priesthood and masonry. Brother Joseph Smith says masonry was taken from priesthood. Benjamin F. Johnson, Joseph Smith told me Freemasonry as at present was the apostate endowments, as sectarian religion was the apostate religion. Joseph Fielding, the LDS Temple Ordinances are the true origin of Masonry. Now on the church website, actually, Joseph and his associates understood Masonry as an institution that priests uh, preserved vestiges of ancient truth. They acknowledged parallels between Masonic rituals and the endowment, but concluded based on their experiences with both, the ordinance was divinely restored. Remember, the Lord speaks to them and their, their understanding and their circumstances, um, and they were going through both and, and viewed it uh, uh, this way. How would they, how would they uh, see this uh, in their time and experience? Okay, dark, uh, Dr. Mark Rivera is a Latter-day Saint and a, and a Mason, and he actually uh, has written a lot. He presented at a worldwide Freemasonry conference um, and I'm going to share a couple of fascinating uh, uh, comments he shared uh, there, and I'll link it in the, in the program. I believe that this pattern is key to understanding the emergence of the LDS temple ceremonies. As we have seen, Joseph Smith came to the Mason his Masonic initiation in 1842 with years of experience that give his initiation a unique context. For over 20 years, Smith had shown a pattern of encountering sacred texts, pondering them prayerfully, and then receiving major revelation. Now, if I can say, as an example, James 1.5, uh, pondering that text led to the first vision. Um, as they pondered baptism and translating the Book of Mormon led to the experience of receiving the um, uh, uh, priesthood restoration. Um, as they pondered the resurrection, uh, that's when he and Sidney Rigdon had this hour-long vision of the three degrees of glory in the upper room of the John Johnson farm. Um, the book of Abraham, as he pondered the Egyptian scrolls, receiving that revelation um, there. So for seven years, Smith had been in possession of ancient Egyptian texts that dealt with ritual initiation. Smith had been involved in the development of rituals for temple worship for over a year. Based on uh, other revelations he had received, Smith had been expecting to receive major revelations involving the bestowal of temple rituals. With these sorts of concerns on his mind, Joseph Smith received the first three degrees of Masonic initiation in March 1842. Those who have been through the craft degrees of Masonic initiation know that when the ceremonies are conducted well, they are solemn occasions that can make a long-lasting impression upon the candidate. It is my belief that the three Masonic ceremonies of ritual initiation constituted for Smith another sacred text for him to ponder and meditate upon. In turn, I believe this pondering and contemplation over the weeks following his initiation became a context for Smith to receive a major revelation consistent with the pattern in which Smith had received some major revelations before. And then the endowment came about several months later. And in fact, the, the official church website says this, uh, similar thoughts. There are different ways of understanding the relationship between masonry and the temple. Some Latter-day Saints point to similarities between the format and symbols of both the endowment and Masonic rituals, and those of many ancient religious ceremonies as evidence that the endowment was a restoration of an ancient ordinance. Others note that the ideas and institutions in the culture that surrounded Joseph Smith frequently contributed to the process by which he obtained revelation. In any event, the endowment did not simply imitate the rituals of Freemasonry. Rather, Joseph's encounter with Masonry evidently served as a catalyst for revelation. The Lord restored the temple ordinances through Joseph Smith to teach profound truths about the plan of salvation and introduce covenants that would allow God's children to enter his presence. So then Dr. Rivera continues, and he says, I believe Joseph Smith's Masonic initiation was a sort of catalyst and event that prepared Smith's mind to receive the major temple-related revelation that he had been awaiting for over a year. Smith's Masonic initiation also provided him with a sort of ritual vocabulary, something that his general Protestant upbringing in upstate New York had not provided to him. According to this interpretation of events, Joseph Smith neither violated his obligation as a Freemason by revealing Masonic ritual nor plundered Masonic ritual for the LDS endowment ceremony. The experience of Masonic 
initiation prepared Smith's mind to receive through revelation an extensive body of ritual for the LDS Temple endowment. However, the one was not stolen from the other. A direct comparison of important aspects of the Masonic ritual of initiation with the LDS Temple endowment ceremony is highly instructive. And I love this, by the way, because he, he is a uh, Mason and a Latter-day Saint. The symbolic meaning of the gestures is paramount, as I believe they, they are symbols of the specific covenants that the temple patron has made. There are those who would say that the, the very existence of ritual gestures in the LDS temple ceremony raises suspicion of some Masonic origin. The example of history says otherwise. One may find ritual postures and gestures. Watch the other video I mentioned, <laughs> illustrated within the art of many religious and spiritual groups across the earth and through the centuries. For example, in Egyptian sacred artwork, one may see what seem to be ceremonial postures Postures and gestures. Some people have claimed that these um, seem similar to postures and gestures found in the LDS Temple ceremony. As another example, dozens of symbolic gestures or mudras are to be found within the religious traditions of Hinduism, Buddhism, and Taoism. Some people have claimed that some of these seem similar to gestures in the LDS Temple ceremony. And it's obviously senseless to claim that Joseph Smith stole his temple ceremonies from the ancient Egyptians, the Hindus, the Taoists, or Japanese Buddhists. There was little in the way of literature on these traditions available to general readers on the American frontier during the 1830s and 1840s. Then he finishes, the, the fact of the matter is that symbolic postures and gestures are part of the symbolism of spiritual and initiatic traditions throughout the human history, our present Western culture being relatively uneducated in matters of serious and esoteric spirituality is relatively unfamiliar with the aspect of spiritual symbolism, but the Masons are not unfamiliar with it and neither are the Mormons. Of course, all of this raises the question of why such things as symbolic postures or gestures should have any spiritual significance at all. It makes sense for human spirituality to be expressed in physical ways, the use of ceremonial body postures and gestures serves to involve the body quite directly in a spiritual endeavor. Adopting a certain posture or making a certain gesture sends a message to the mind that now we are doing something different, something special, something meaningful. I love this. Donald Perry and Joseph Philly McConkie said this on symbolism. Symbols are the universal tongue. Symbols bring color and strength to language. While deepening and enriching our understanding, symbols enable us to give conceptual form to ideas and emotions that may otherwise defy the power of words. They take us beyond words and grant us eloquence in the expression of feelings. Symbolic language conceals certain doctrinal truths from the wicked and thereby protects sacred things from possible ridicule. At the same time, symbols reveal truth to the spiritually alert. Symbols are the language in which all gospel covenants and all ordinances of salvation have been revealed. From the time we are immersed in the waters of baptism to the time we kneel at the altar of the temple with the companion of our choice in the ordinance of eternal marriage, every covenant we make will be written in the language of symbolism. And then John Witzow said, uh, the endowment is so richly symbolic that only a fool would attempt to describe it as so packed full of revelations to those who exercise their strength to seek and see that no human words can explain or make clear the possibilities that reside in temple service. The endowment which was given by revelation can best be understood by revelation and to those who seek most vigorously with pure hearts will the revelation be the greatest. Okay, now let's talk about some symbols. The compass and the square symbol uh, used in, in masonry and, and Latter-day Saints. Um, Matthew Brown talks about uh, this in the book. He's part of B. Pratt reported in his autobiography that in the year 1830, he was shown shapes that correspond to these particular instruments, the compass and the square, in a heavenly vision, and they were not displayed to him in a Masonic fashion either. Uh, the compass and square are biblical symbols in the sense that they were actually mentioned in the 1599 Geneva Bible in a footnote for 1 Corinthians 3.3. 3. But take a look at this slide. <laughs> Going way back, um, there's ancient paintings uh, showing the uh, first rulers of China holding the tools of creation, the compass and the square. I talked about this in the other uh, video. Um, one of the earliest images of the square is a carpenter from the tomb of Rechmeyer in Egypt in the 18th dynasty uh, there. Um, so interesting things there. The Royal Arch degree, which is a, a optional advanced degree in masonry, um, also Joseph did not participate in that, but um, some people point to that as also a source of the temple because it involves robes and going through a veil to the Holy of Holies. Well, that's exactly what the Bible says too. That was what uh, happened in Solomon's temple. Uh, so again, uh, interesting things there. So hand clasp. Um, look at look at the dates uh, uh, on the on here. First of all, this goes way back anyway. Um, watch the other video on that. But look at these dates. 1832, the right hand of fellowship was given by uh, Elder Partridge. Uh, 1836, the first president and 12 took each other by the hand in confirmation of their covenant with each other. 1839, I love this one. Joseph taught the members of the first presidency. This is in DNC 129. One of the keys of the kingdom, which was how to detect the nature of another worldly, uh, uh, otherworldly visitor by means of a hand clasp. 
Holiness to the Lord. That appears on the wall in the Masonic Lodge. Uh, it's also uh, on the, uh, every temple. It's also in Exodus 28. <laughs> uh, Thou shalt make a plate of pure gold engraved upon it, the engravings of a sin, holiness to the Lord, and that's to be worn upon the forehead of the high priest, been consecrated uh, for the ordinances. Um, bees in the beehive, um, this is kind of uh, used by lots, but it's, it was also in the Book of Mormon. Book of, in Ether 2 3 talks about uh, honeybees called Deseret. Uh, 1832, uh, we have this comment here, industry like the bees, that's in, uh, 1841, the, uh, working on the temple, busy as bees um, there. Another one is aprons, uh, stonemasons wore aprons, so they, they, wore, they wear aprons uh, there. The Latter-day Saints wore aprons uh, to represent Genesis 3, where it talks about uh, Adam and Eve wearing uh, uh, aprons, and that was the, the symbolic reference to those totally different meanings. The Eye of Providence, or the All-Seeing Eye. Uh, Book of Mormon verses, here you can see them there talking about the All-Seeing Eye uh, that's uh, there. Um, look at this Christian painting, uh, Act of 1525. Uh, fascinating. Uh, Proverbs 3, the Eye of the Lord, or in very uh, place, beholding the evil and the good. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore thine eye be single, the whole body shall be full of light. Now this has become a big sim symbol of the Illuminati, uh, which is just conspiracy theories. The Illuminati was squashed. Uh, uh, anyway, the, uh, centuries ago, but it was started in 1776 in um, Bavaria by Adam Weisset. Um, he established the Order of the Illuminati, and then a year later he became a Mason. And he tried uh, to start um, uh, uh, recruiting uh, people into this order from the Masons, so that's why it ended up the Illuminati often being tied to the Masons. Um, their goal was actually to replace the monarchy there in Bavaria uh, with a Republican government. Um, the uh, police destroyed them eight years later, uh, demolished uh, the order. Um, everyone was kicked out of Bavaria and all, all Masons as well. Uh, but rumors continue to persist uh, to this day, uh, as you well know, I'm sure. Um, and this all-seeing eye is, is often uh, used as a uh, symbol of the Illuminati. Uh, I love this. Look at this screen here. Uh, this eye of providence is on the $1 bill. You look at it there, and look what happened. 1782. Now Freemasonry, they they adopted this in their iconography in 1797. So it wasn't from the Masons. This was existed well before uh, that. And I showed you the painting from 15 uh, the 1500s. Um, but I love this on uh, uh, this this Latin uh, uh, annuitus coptus. He approves our undertakings or has approved. This is God. And those 13 steps there representing. Um, the state, the original states, and then the future growth, uh, the unfinished pyramid there, uh, there. So kind of, kind of cool. Um, then the uh, pentagram. So take a look at all these pictures of pentagrams here. Um, the bottom left is from ancient Israel. It was viewed as uh, the first five books uh, of the uh, Hebrew Bible, the Pentateuch. Um, uh, uh, and the middle one is from the Masons. Uh, the top right is the uh, pentagram pointing down. Um, this was thought of as Christ, and the five points of uh, the wounds of Christ um, and coming down to earth often was the way that that's why we put it on the Nabu temple pointing down Christ coming down uh, to earth um, but then this uh, was uh, adopted and, and, and uh, changed uh, into a symbol of the occult. Uh, it's crazy, but it happened in 1856. A Catholic deacon, um, Alphonse Constant, he changed his name to Eliphas Levi. He became, uh, he was a Mason, a Catholic deacon, but he became very involved in the occult and magic. And uh, he adopted the symbol and it said the inverted pen pentagram specifically meant evil. Uh, there and that was in 1856. So again, it's, it's sad uh, how, but not surprising. Satan would want to try and turn some of these beautiful symbols into there. Now I love the aspect of this symbol, by the way, uh, of Venus, the morning star. Jesus Christ Himself in Revelation 22 refers to Himself as the morning star, and that was looked at. Uh, that is the star. Um, Venus is the closest uh, uh, planet to Earth. And when it's on the other side of the sun, it leads the sun up in the morning. It appears several hours before, and it's the bringer of light, the Greeks called it um, there, as they referred to it as the morning star. If you look at the pattern that Venus forms over eight years in rotating around the sun, it is a pentagram. I just love that symbolism. It's beautiful. Um, that's all there, and again, desecrated uh, by Satan with trying to make this a symbol of the occult. 
And um, Truman Angel uh, actually wrote a letter to the uh, pro pro prophet uh, uh, John Taylor addressing symbols on the temple and, and informed him in writing that none of the symbols on the building's exterior were meant to be Masonic. And then last, I want to finish with this. Scott Gordon in the 2017 Fair Mormon Commerce gave a phenomenal presentation on Mormon temples and Freemasonry. Uh, I, I put it in the show notes. Um, you can watch it or read it. But I love the way he ended with a Q&A. And I want to share these key things. He says, did Joseph simply copy the temple ceremony from the Masons? No. There is too much in the temple that isn't related to what goes on in Masonry. Question, are there elements in the endowment ceremony that are found in Masonry? Yes, there are a few, but they have been completely repurposed. Certainly the temple ceremony contains some of the phrases, wording, and symbols that exist within Masonry, but these things, both Masonic and Biblical, were part of the world Joseph Smith lived in. Just as we use movie language in our speaking, it's not surprising to have some Masonic language in the world of Joseph Smith. Question, does Freemasonry go back to the time of King Solomon, or is it a modern creation? Answer, we don't know and we have no way of knowing. While members of the church like the idea of masonry from the ancient temple, and it is what early church members believed and taught, currently thought lends towards a more modern origin of Freemasonry. Nevertheless, even if there were a more modern origin, masonry included biblical temple themes and ancient symbols. Question, did Joseph copy those similar elements from modern Freemasonry or do they stem from Solomon's temple and other ancient temples? Answer, we don't know and we have no way of knowing. Question, did Joseph Smith simply believe something was ancient that was really modern and copy that into a fake temple ceremony? No. Even if you stripped out all the elements that overlap with masonry, the temple ceremony is surprisingly in alignment with ancient temples. Watch my other video. The Lord wanted to give us a gift of or endowment. He directed Joseph Smith to create a ceremony where we would make covenants with God and receive promised blessings. The teachings, covenants, and promises within that temple ceremony do not come from masonry. Even if it were to take the position that Joseph Smith took the revealed covenants and designed a ceremony himself to remind us of those covenants on a regular basis, Joseph Smith would still be a prophet acting within his calling. We take the sacrament each week to symbolically reenact the Last Supper while we make covenants. In the temple, we are symbolically reminded of our purpose in life and how we should follow God. I know that that theme comes from God and is ancient in origin. And then he concludes by saying, Masonry focuses on man's relationship to man, while the temple now focuses on man's relationship to God. While there may be some passing similarities between some Masonic rituals and the temple ritual endowment, the teachings, the covenants, and the purpose are completely different. Did Joseph Smith use some of the words and symbols from Masonry to create the temple ceremonies? Probably, but only a very small amount that he repurposed for a different meaning. Did the Masons use words and symbols from Solomon's Temple to create their Masonic ceremonies, or were they purely 17th century uh, creations? I don't think anybody knows that answer for sure, but it really doesn't matter, because the claim Joseph Smith borrowed the endowment ceremony from Masonry, whether created in the 17th century or not, is clearly false. While there are a few similarities, the entire purpose and intent is different. Instead of believing that Joseph Smith copied the ceremony from the Masons, it makes much more sense to say that Joseph Smith received the promises and covenants of the temple from God and from scriptures, but he also adapted and repurposed some things he was exposed to in Freemasonry to assist in that temple ceremony. Whether those few repurposed Masonic elements are of ancient or modern origin, I will leave up to you, and I will leave it up to you as well. Hope you enjoyed the video. Subscribe for more. Thanks.